Well, good morning, Southmore Baptist Church. I want to welcome you today to worship with us. We're so glad that you're here with us. Guests, if it is your first time with us, we'd love for you to take an opportunity to grab a card uh, to fill this out and put it out in the offering plate. And if you want, you can scan that QR card to find out some more about our church. I got some brief announcements before uh, we go into worship. Uh, today, the youth is going to watch Kung Fu Panda 4. Uh, we are going to be meeting up there at 2.30 p.m. And remember, those who told me that you're going to go, I've pre-bought our tickets. And so uh, if you would, just pay that to me today if you can for $10 for each ticket. And, um, and we'll be doing that today. And then on March 17th, we have choir practice, which is today at 5 p.m. And so make sure that you are there for that. And then next week on March 23rd at 9 a.m., we're going to have a work day to kind of get our church ready for uh, our big day of Easter and our Easter egg hunt that's going to be taking place. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer to sign up for that as well. But also, there is a sign-up for snacks. We have a separate form for snacks. If you'd like to help out to participate to help provide snacks for that day, we'd greatly appreciate that as well. And we're still needing those eggs uh, to be filled. That If you got some eggs, please make sure you bring those back as well with candy filled. And if you have some candy to donate, we'd appreciate that as well. And then also this Wednesday night, we'll be meeting together for Bible study. But before we do, we'll have dinner together. We'll have beef and noodles at night. Our dinners are always awesome on Wednesdays, and our Bible studies are always great. So I want to encourage you to come back with your family again on Wednesday. And then every Sunday, we have volleyball at 6 p.m. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to our video just real quick. We never intended to plant a church. We are Christians. We needed to have devotion with our kids, Bible study with our kids. So, started Bible study here. And I think we probably, we probably are not uh, realizing what's going on. We had one parent showed up. He was just passing by. We were in the middle of doing Bible study with our kids. Oh, you guys have a Bible study? Then he totally um, spread the word and the family started to come in and show up and say, if you are bringing the kids to Bible study, why don't we have church for everybody? I guess they, they saw something that they couldn't find in our area. That's how we ended up planting an Haitian church right here in Philadelphia. It was designed with kids in mind. My name is Keisha Renee, and I'm 16 years old. When God picks somebody to do a job, he doesn't, like, go off of the age that you are. You have to be willing to just do whatever God needs you to do. And I just felt like I had a job to do. There are kids standing, leading the service. They are integrated. They are part of everything that we do. And families come because, because of what the Lord is doing. Raising generations of children, of people, of servants, and God is at work. But it started with that burden of seeing something different. So not even a year ago did we think that we were ever going to be in such a circumstance. But we would rather do nothing else but this. This is it. This is what transpires for an eternity. Good morning, church. Please stand if you can do so comfortably. And everyone, let's let's sing to the Lord this morning. Let's raise our voices. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can But the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon is 
this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. thought I knew what I was talking about when I testified of your great love. I was a soul on fire, there was no doubt about who believed and saved and washed in the blood. But it was until I stumbled and made my mistakes that I could know in my soul how amazing was grace. You brought me blessings out of tragedy. You turned my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside of me, I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. I know what you were talking about went to my head into my heart when I was broken at the bottom I found you my healer my redeemer Jesus that's who you are you brought me blessings out of a tragedy you took my old song into a symphony and with your spirit living inside of me i'm a new creation i'm a new creation oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh spirit living inside of me yeah i'm a new creation brought me blessings out of a tragedy you turned my old song into a symphony and with your spirit living inside of me oh i'm a new creation i'm a new creation oh, oh, oh. brought me blessings out of a tragedy you turned my old song into a symphony and with your spirit living inside of me i'm a new creation i'm a new creation
Matthew chapter 9, we find in verse 36 that the Bible says that when the Lord saw the crowds, he felt sorry for them, for they were hurting and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The question I want to ask this morning is that what does Jesus see when he looks at you? and looks at me. Let me ask you another question. Why did Jesus do what he did and go to the cross for us? Because he saw us as sheep without a shepherd. And he knew that he could only do for us no one else could do, that he laid down his life for you and me we couldn't fix our problem, but he did. I'm so glad when the Lord saw me, he saw me as desperate and needy and wanting a Savior. Let's praise him this morning and let's thank him for what he did for us. You can join me at the altar. You can stay right where you're at, but let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do come this morning lifting our voices to you. I can picture in my mind Jesus sitting next to God on the right hand and even now as we pray he's saying to his heavenly father dad uh, there's some people here at South Mo Baptist Church who are hurting and they're helpless there's some folks here that need some answers So, Lord, I thank you that you hear us, and I thank you that you uh, relay our prayers to our Heavenly Father, and that you see us as we are. You don't turn your back on us. You don't run away. You don't give up on us. You see us sheep needing a pastor and needing a shepherd. So, Lord, today I pray that your Holy Spirit will fall on this place and that you'll do something pretty incredible today. So, Lord, hear our, hear our prayer. God, uh, look into our hearts. And, uh, and bless today. For I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand and let's sing. Yeah. 
Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, 
there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being in your house this morning, Lord, and we're just so gracious for your love and your blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. I pray that you'll be with uh, this offering as it's taken up in your name. We pray for the nation of Israel and its people, and I pray that you will just uh, be with our nation, Lord, and help to guide it closer to you and your love. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> the tomb that day just shuffling soldiers feet as they go Look. 
look at him, he's dead. But the father looked down to his son and said, Arise, my love, arise, my love. The grave no longer has a hold on you. No more death, no more suffering. Arise, arise. The earth trembled and the two. your shackles death where is your sting hell has been defeated the grave could not hold Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Thank you, Miss Donetta, for leading us this morning in special music. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me in your New Testament, the book of Mark, Mark chapter 11. In a few moments, I'll begin reading in verse 1. I want us to consider this subject together this morning. The triumphal entry. As we know, this is the Easter season, and uh, not that we will have time to follow each of the Lord's footsteps during these last days, but 
we'll get some of those. But I want us to notice particularly today the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. December the 4th, 1977, in Bengai, Africa, the world was watching the coronation of Imperial Majesty Bogasa I. The price tag of his coronation was $23 million. At 10, 10 a.m., the announcement of his approaching there was the blare of trumpets, the roll of drums, and the procession began. And as the procession made its way down the streets, there were eight palasa, 29 official, I'm sorry, there was eight of Bogasa's 29 official children who prayed it down on red carpet and to their seats. Followed his children was Jean Burdell Bogasa II, dressed in a beautiful white admiral's uniform with gold braid. He was seated on a red pillow. Catherine followed. Catherine was Bogasa's favorite wife out of nine. Catherine was wearing a $73,000 gown. It was filled with pearls that she had hand-selected. When the imperial, imperial arrived, the emperor arrived, he was riding in a gold eagle bedecked coach drawn by six beautiful Anglo-Norman horses. He wore a 32-pound robe and decorated with 785,000 pearls and gold embroidery. He wore a gold crown also worth $2.5 million. As the procession continued, Bokasa himself was seated on a $2.5 million throne. And then he took his $2.5 million throne and placed it on the head of his son. Bogasa's reign only lasted for two years. And then he left the country because the French engineered a coup. And he left town. Sad to say, at the expense of his 200 children who were executed because they complained at the cost of their school uniforms. When I mention this procession and this crowning, it's, a, it's kind of a head scratcher. We ask ourselves, why, why would someone go to that link and this kind of procession to say that I am now your king. I have an answer to my, my question. I, I think what Bogasa represents is like, if not all of us, most of us, that throughout our lives, we are doing our best to exalt ourselves. Let, let me explain. We do our best to say, here I am. We, we do our best, and it starts at a very young age, doesn't it? it we, 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 we start at a young age, say, look at me, look at me, look at me. No, no, put the spotlight on me. Take a close look at me. Look, look what I can do. I, I remember as a kid going to the swimming pool, and uh, it was in the summertime there in Dexter, New Mexico. Hegerman, where I lived, they didn't have a swimming pool swimming pool so we had to go about six miles to Dexter and uh, and and we, we waited before we would dive off the high dive to make sure all the girls on the ground was looking at us you, you, you get the picture huh but whether uh, someone diving off a diving board or 
a cheerleader or someone in the classroom or just someone on the block on the street where you live it, we, we, we do things to say to our neighbors look at us look at look at our yard look at our greenery and look at our flowers and this that and again I think you'd agree that uh, that we do our best to exalt ourselves and say to people look at me what a contrast when we come to the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem on Passover he's not demanding any attention at all he is coming into Jerusalem in a in a way that would cause us to shake our heads and say his entry is not fit for a king why, why would he so choose to enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey Mark gives us the story of the Lord's triumphal entry and, and answers some of our questions and so this morning I want you to notice first of all as we think of the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem I, I want you to notice the king's preparation in Mark chapter 11 verse 1 we read as as they as the Lord Jesus and his disciples and now the crowds that are growing as they're following him approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives Bethage was a small hamlet just between the uh, Bethany and Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and they came to Bethage and Bethlehem at the Mount of Olives now they have entered and uh, and the first thing we see in, in this this grand entry this triumphal entry we see the Lord's preparation and, and keep in mind that that everything that took place Jesus was in control it, it wasn't him flying by the seat of his pants it, it, was, it wasn't uh, an afterthought everything that we see and hear and read here in this mark chapter 11 we find that Jesus Christ is calculated it's premeditated he's planned this out he knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it and we see first of all here in verse 1 he says and he reached the Mount of Olives and Jesus sent two of his disciples notice verse 2 he says saying to them go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden before untie it and bring it here and if anyone asks you well, why are you doing this just tell him the Lord needs it and and he will send it back shortly Jesus sends two of disciples out go get a colt you, you'll, you'll find a colt tied up and and uh, and go get that colt and if someone asks you, well, what are you doing? You say, well, well the, Lord, the Lord needs this coat. You see, by, by now, and, and keep in mind that, that Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and, and word got out, even though that there wasn't uh, cell phones and technology where news travels fast, again, in these small communities of Bethany and Bethage and now on the edge of Jerusalem, word gets out have you heard Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and and why would someone want to go and see this man especially now it's Passover time and tens of thousands millions of people are coming into Jerusalem and this is a high excitement also high attention and now we, we find that uh, these great crowds are following the Lord Jesus and now he's preparing his grand entry into the city and he says to the disciples go find a colt and guess what they found a colt tied up and then he says, if someone asks you, but what, what, what are you doing taking this coat? He says, well, the Lord needs it. And that settles it, doesn't it? The Lord needs it. R remember there in the, the Lord's Supper, Jesus sends Peter and John out to, as we saw last week, sent them out to say, go, go find a man who is carrying a water pot. And when you find him, follow him and he'll show you to where we're going to have our last supper in the upper room and now we see again here the Lord Jesus in control giving his disciples instructions for his grand entry in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 and we ask ourselves 
Why would Jesus choose to ride an unwritten, unwritten colt for a donkey? Well, he did so also because Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 prophesies this is the way the king of kings would enter into Jerusalem. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. That just doesn't seem to fit, does it? Why, why, why would the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey? We, we, we would think that he would come riding on a beautiful black stallion and with all the pomp and ceremony. But he chose not to do it that way. You remember that when he came into this world, and when Joseph and Mary were coming into Bethlehem to register, again, the city was filled with people, and there was no room in the inn. And, and where was Jesus born? He was born in a manger. And here again, we, we see the personality and the character and humility of the Lord Jesus. Notice not only the, the promise of a colt, but also the provision of a colt. And in verse 4, we read, They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied it at the doorway, and, and they untied it. And, and some of the people standing there asked, What are you doing? Untying that colt. And they answered, notice in verse 6, They answered, Jesus had told us. And the people let him go. Let me make mention before we move on. When Jesus tells you to do something, it's to your benefit and his that you do it. You, you don't have to wonder. You don't have to question. You don't have to doubt. And, and in whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. And, and, and I know you're like me and I'm like you and we're all like each other. That The Lord tells us to do something and we sometimes scratch our head and wonder, was, is, is, is the Lord really want me to do this? Did I hear from him correctly? We read in God's word to be kind and be sweet and be forgiving, be, be, evangel be evangelistic, be salt and light and, 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 and let our light shine. And, 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 and we know that what God wants us to do. And then we say, well, I'm not sure he wants us to do this. And uh, again, don't, don't doubt, don't delay. Just obey God's word. And this is what his disciples did. And they found the coat. And then when they were asked, what in the world are you doing? Are you trying to steal this coat? And they said, no, the Lord told us to come and get him. Let me ask you another question. What, what is it in your life? Now, this is going to get real personal. And uh, you, you'll not be able to dodge this bullet. What, what in your life, what, what do you have that God wants? What, what is it? What, 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 what do you have to offer the Lord? You say, well, preacher, I, I don't have anything to give to him. Yes, you do. If you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and you love him and you're following him, then he, he, has, he has something he wants from you and, and he can use from you. So, so what is it? And I, I know oftentimes, and, and, and I, I know how the church goes, and I, I've been standing behind a pope for a long time, and I know church life and church characteristics and, and personalities and all of that, and, and yet, but every church is the same. Every pastor is looking for more people to serve. The Lord needs your help. The Lord wants your help. And you say, well, well Preacher, the, the Lord doesn't need anything. No, no, he, he doesn't really need it, but, but he, he wants to use you for his glory. And, and, uh, and the question is, what do you have to offer God? 
your voice, your talent, your time, your tithe? What is it that you can give to the Lord that will bring him glory? You say, I don't have anything. Yes, you do. If you're born again, you love Jesus, and you're following him, you have something to offer the Lord in his ministry. You know what God's people said? We see, secondly, not, not only the Lord's preparation, and again, Jesus is in control. He's calling the shots. This is not an afterthought. He had planned this out before the foundations of the world. He, he knew that he had entered in Jerusalem and be his last days on earth before he has ascended. But notice now, I want you to notice the procession itself. In verse 7, we read, when they brought the coat of Jesus and threw the cloaks over it, he sat on it. The procession is gaining momentum. The crowds are getting larger and larger. There's a great excitement going on. And now the cult is brought and, uh, and those around and closest to the Lord and the cult, they, they begin to take their coats off, their cloaks off and put it over the, the cult in order to be used in front of a, a saddle. And now Jesus is sitting on this cult. He's sitting on a donkey. People now are recognizing who he is. And, and, and the enthusiasm is building and growing moment by moment. And we can, we can only imagine the, the, the excitement and uh, the enthusiasm was taking place. And, and it's almost out, out of control. And, and, and people are shouting and cheering. And, and, and now the procession is about to begin. And, and I want you to notice a, a few things as we begin this procession with the Lord Jesus. As I mentioned before, I, I want you to notice his humility and his lowliness. Keep in mind, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I mean, he, he's riding on a donkey. And, and I, I'm sure some are looking at him and saying to themselves and scoffing, who, who is this one? Who is this Jesus? Who is this miracle man riding on a donkey? If he was somebody, he, he would choose differently, surely, and so the, the taunting and the scoffing begins, and, and yet the crowds continue to be excited, and they make their way down the streets of Jerusalem. And there's a frenzy now going on. Jesus, King of Kings, is coming into town. And we see him humbling himself. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, in reference to the Lord Jesus, said, he made himself nothing. He said, I, I don't have to have all the attention. I, I don't have to say to anyone that I'm a somebody. But he came as a servant, as a son, lowering himself to our level. We ask, why would he do such a thing? That, that way he could see us eye to eye. You see, the Lord Jesus always comes and meets us right where we are. And he looks at you and he looks at me and he says, I... I see something special in you. I, I see something I can use. And so he sets the example. He didn't have to enter into the Jerusalem that way, but he chose to do so. Again, being an example for you and me to follow, that we too will humble ourselves and follow the Lord God. But we see not only his lowliness, but also his loftiness. And verse 8, we read, Many people spread their cloaks. Now, not only they put their cloaks on the horse, on the donkey, but now they're putting their cloaks and also they're spreading branches that they'd cut from the fields. And the parade continues. Thousands and thousands of people were now following the Lord Jesus. And the parade, the procession continues, and it builds and builds. In contrast... When a Roman general came back home after battle and a Roman general's victory in battle 
there would be a great parade, a great procession. Unlike the Lord's Jesus entry into Jerusalem, these Roman generals, they, they would come in and there would be animals and there would be elephants and tigers and exotic animals. The general would be seated on this wonderful chariot and, and uh, soldiers around him. And as, as the chariot would make its way down the street, there would be other soldiers on each side of the chariot with their swords held high and, and they'd be shouting and as the parade continued and recognizing the victory of their king and rejoicing and saying and shouting, this is our king. What a contrast to the way Jesus entered in to Jerusalem. And so we've seen the procession, we've seen the preparation, but now I want you to notice the praise. In, in verse 9, Mark writes, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This phrase here in verse 9 is also mentioned in Psalm chapter 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I want you to notice that the people are shouting. And, and as the procession continues, that there were those who were in front of Jesus riding on the donkey and those nearest to him. And there are, of course, those who are behind. And so he, he, here comes these hundreds, if not thousands, of people following the Lord Jesus. And they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. M many scholars believe that, that those in the front of the procession, they were shouting, Hosanna. And then when they would shout, Hosanna, then those in the back of the procession, they would shout, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there'd be just a shouting back and forth. I think we ought to try that this morning, don't you? Okay, this, this is what we're going to do. Right down the middle, you on this side, and if you don't know if you're in the middle or not, just fake it. But, but here, here's the middle. You on this side, you're going to shout, Hosanna. And you on this side, after they shout, Hosanna, you will shout, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You ready to try this? All right. I'm grading you, so here we go. All right, all right. Here we go. What did you say? You're supposed to say Hosanna. Did you say Hosanna? Okay. All right, let me say. It sounded like rah, rah, rah. I, 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 I don't know. Obviously, this is not working out the way I thought it might. Okay, here, here we go again. One more time. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, obviously, when the Lord Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, there was great celebration. There's great jubilation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This word Hosanna means save or save now or great victory now. And when the people were shouting Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, unknowing to some of them, this was prophetic. This was prophecy. That They were shouting Yes, our king is coming. And, and God's people, they were tired of being bullied and, and mistreated by the Roman government. And, and their hopes was that one day that God would send a Messiah, that he would deliver them from all of this, uh, all of this chaos and all of this ill treatment by the Roman government. And so when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, many of them thought that uh, Jesus would come and establish an army on earth at this time to defeat the Romans. But also, and most importantly, they were looking for a Messiah, someone to come and, and lead them. We see the, the jubilation, and it was a, a sight to behold. Luke tells us that when uh, the people were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, L Luke says, if the people will not shout for themselves, 
that the rocks will cry out. You see, God is going to receive his praise one way or another. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that you don't want any rocks shouting out and representing you, do you? You'll shout it out for yourself. Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now we enter into Jerusalem. The people are still excited. They're still chanting. They're still shouting. They're still praising. They're still saying, yes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then in Mark chapter 11, verse 10, Mark writes, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. In Matthew chapter 21, listen to these words. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? This word stirred is where we get our English word seismic, which means there's, there's a great explosion. And I think that's a good description of the frenzy and the excitement when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, that there was this explosion of praise, an explosion of excitement as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 21, we read, the crowds answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Who is this? They were asking, who is this? They didn't even say, who is this man? They said, who is this? Who is this one riding on a donkey, parading here into our town on Passover? Who is this? The world is still asking that very same question. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? I, I hope, Southmore Baptist Church, that as we're nearing Easter, that when people are wondering and all that goes on in our Easter season and all the activities and all the special programs and the Easter egg hunts and all those things, and, and I'm all in favor of those things, but we have a great opportunity to tell people who Jesus is. Why do we do what we do during this time of the year? that Jesus Christ, Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, He came, He lived, He lived the life He lived, and He died the death He died, and He came for you and for me. What an opportunity. The door opens this time of the year, and we should be telling people and shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, and that Jesus is our King. Church, let's get on board, and let's do our part and share the good news of Jesus Christ, especially during this time of the year. Who is this man? Who is this one? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let me ask you a personal question. Who is this Jesus that I've been talking about this morning? Is he just some biblical figure, biblical name that's familiar to all of us? Is he just some far away, distant Savior, Son of God? Or is he your closest friend? Or is Jesus the one you run to when you need help? Is Jesus the one you run to when you need answers? Is Jesus the one you look to to live life even in itself? What an opportunity we have here during this time of the year to tell others about Jesus. More importantly, is Jesus Christ in your heart, not just some distant Son of God seated at the right hand, but is He seated on your heart? Let's pray together. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, I want, I want you to picture in your own mind uh, the Lord with his disciples riding on that colt into the city. And what a day that was. And now I want you to 
relive that moment when Jesus came into your heart and your life and you received him as your Savior and King. Church, it's our time to shine. No, it's, it's the Lord's time to shine. And he wants to use you and me. Would you commit to sharing the gospel, sharing your faith, sharing your life story to those around you? He will help you. Tell your story. Tell your testimony. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Christ. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's God's promise to you. Right now, this very moment, you can make the most important to save your life. You can trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He won't barge in. He won't rush into your life. He'll only come in when you invite him. Would you do that right now? You say, well, preacher, I'm not quite sure I know how. Let me help you. Say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Take ownership of this prayer. I admit that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. The Bible says when one person asks Christ in their heart that the angels in heaven rejoice. There's a celebration going on right now just for you. Father, I pray that our response to your amazing grace will bring you glory. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would remain seated and silent and prayerful and heads bowed and the invitation begins. The all. The altar is open. You can come, and there'll be someone here to pray with you and for you. And perhaps you just want to come and uh, pray yourself. That's quite all right. You come. All God's people said, thank you for being here this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, let me share some information here that was given to me by Miss Donetta here a few days ago. Um, this Thursday, March the 21st, the Jews will be celebrating the Feast of Esther. If you recall, God used Esther to deliver his people at, at a difficult time and uh, in fact, I, I remember hearing Adrian Rogers preach a sermon from Esther entitled The Horrible Hanging of Hateful Haman. Remember, Haman was out to destroy God's people, and, and God used Esther to deliver his people. And so this, this, I did not know this, that this Thursday, on March the 21st, the Jews will be celebrating the Feast of Esther, and they also will be fasting this coming Thursday from sun up to sundown. 
and we are encouraged and invited to fast that day in order for God to come and do what he did for his people during the days of Esther that God would deliver the people from Gaza and this terrible war that's going on in Israel and so if you can fast that day that would be wonderful we can all pray for sure and so do your part well God bless you thanks for being we've had some guests here some visitors here today and I'm glad that you're here I hope you'll come back and uh, and have a great afternoon and come back this evening we'll have some fun together let's stand and be dismissed as we uh, we go out singing Thank you.